Hi, David Bizard here, and you are watching PowerTech 10. Give me a few minutes of your time, and I will give you the benefit of 50 years of winning a race engine building and high performance street motors. As I hope to make usual, I'm going to start the front end of this video with some recognition and thanks for those people who've helped get this situation to where it is now. In this episode here I'd like to give thanks to the late Dick Maskin. He was the guy that started DART and he started it at a time when the industry compared to now was very young. What Dick did was bring into being the cylinder head industry, the aftermarket aluminum cylinder head industry that we have now. Sure, there were other people doing it, but Dick did it in a way to bring it to a mass production scale. Also, he, he committed a lot of research to what he was doing. Dart heads simply aren't copies of somebody else's heads. It works around the other way. So, what I'd like you to do here is, if you're going to build an engine and Dart has a cylinder head or a block for it, is just take a look at their catalogue. I've been to their factory quite a few times and done research there. So, I can vouch for the fact that it's good American engineering. So make that a point. Go and see what DART has to offer. As most of you will realize, this is the uh, bearing video that I've copied from my old channel. So it's on, now on the rebooted channel. Looking through it, I realized that I didn't make enough emphasis on the performance gains that can be done by modifying the block in the manner I've shown, especially that mains saddle and the area immediately underneath the uh, uh, center main is where that step is. You'll see that. Now, I've only mildly modified it on this particular one because it was, it was not a max effort build, it was just a high effort build. Right, so what I want you to do is note all those block mods. Right, it's not a complete set of block mods by any means, but we'll, we'll go through that in another video. So, when you prep your block, detailing it like that is worth horsepower. I'm not sure I can say exactly how much, but at least six or seven just doing that and the beauty of it is it's time and it's free okay with that we'll get on with the plot so here we go the subject of today's video is bearing clearances the average engine builder when just reconditioning an engine kind of takes it for granted that the bearing clearances are going to be okay because the engine reconditioning shop that he went to supplied him with bearings and a crankshaft supposedly of the right sizes doesn't always work this way mostly it does but the point is this if we're going to do a high performance engine we need to go one step further now, here is the issue. You can spend a lot of money on measuring equipment that you may only use once or twice a year. So how can you meet stringent bearing clearance tolerances without spending big bucks? Well, look at that. I gotta tell you now, it's a method that many pro engine builders look down on, but we're going to show that those, in quotes, many pro engine builders 
might not be giving credit to this simple method of checking bearing clearances, at least not the credit that it deserves. So let's look and see what that is. In my engine building classes, which are mostly uh, for professionals or professional level engine builders, we use the appropriate high accuracy measuring equipment. Equipment like this. For measuring the ID of a bore, be it a cylinder bore, bearing bore, or camshaft bore, whatever, we use a bore gauge like this, either in digital or analog form. This one here is a, uses a regular uh, tenth reading dial gauge. Something like this is nice to have. A professional engine builder will own something like this and for somebody who's in business doing engines, this is not a very expensive piece from somewhere like Goodson. However, it is a decided think twice investment for a guy who's building an engine at home and may only build one or two engines a year, he's a student still at school or whatever, might be over the top. As for micrometers like this, well, let me tell you about those. Micrometers like this can be had at very reasonable prices from Harbor Freight. Now you only get what you pay for, right? The thing is, is if you're building engines at home and you're just doing it for yourself and maybe one or two for your buddies, you're not going to use these mics enough to wear them out. And if you make sure you get a micrometer with a standard to check it and you'll need a, a two inch micrometer and a three inch one for doing these bearings then you should be in pretty good shape. However, there are ways and means of checking bearings and we're going to talk about main bearings and rod bearings here, right? Without all of this equipment. But before we go into that, let's cover a few details of the engine that I'm building here. Right? It should make this video a bit more fun than just looking at bearing clearances. What we have here is a pre-roller blocked small block Chevy. They uh, phased these out about 1980 ish right and they went for the roller block this block sonic out pretty good and I was able to bore this one plus 60 so it's a four inch 60 bore bit of cubic inches there also since it was a good block instead of just putting in the regular uh, 3.75 stroke crank I decided that I would maximize this, at least a safe maximization, and put in a 3.875 stroke crank, which fits without too much of a bother. That means that this engine it will be 401 cubic inches. That's a nice build, right? But there's a few things I need to show you on this. So let's look into the crankcase first. The points I want you to notice here is how I've blended the bottom of the bores into the bore, rounded it off. Now very often people say, oh you need a sharp edge there to shave the oil off. That's BS. This rounded edge here allows the air to follow the piston up the bore easier, right? And rounding this off like this and blending it all in on an engine like this at 7,000 RPM is worth six or seven horsepower and it's free. Something else you might want to look at here. What I want you to see here is the way that the main bearing housing here has been dressed. 
First, this corner here, and it's difficult to see, has been polished because this is a breakage point. Secondly, this has been rounded off so that oil being pushed down the bore goes off into the crankcase easier. Just take a look at that. That's worth horsepower. So what am I using for a crank for this hopefully mean 401 inch small block Chevy? Well in this particular instance the 3.875 stroke crank I am using is from Callis. It's one of their uh, Compstar cranks. It's not their most expensive but the, the thing I like about this crank is that it it has hollow journals and the counterweights are such that it makes balancing it internally uh, an easy job. Now when I say balanced internally that means being able to balance the crank without having a flywheel and a damper on here that has an out of balance force, sorry an out of balance weight to compensate for the fact there's not enough in, internally. So internally balanced doesn't require out of balance flywheel and damper. Trust me, externally balanced motors are the beginning of trouble. If you're going to turn the engine any kind of RPM, you could run into problems. So an internally balanced one runs smoother, makes more horsepower and is more reliable. Now, if this wasn't such a good block, I would probably be using a SCAT 9000 series cast steel crank. Now what I like about those is it's an incredible deal for the money, i.e. not much money in a real strong crank. However, since we're going with more cubic inches here, this is what I've opted to use. There's not every crankshaft manufacturer out there comes with my blessing. I basically use SCAT cranks for the most part or Callis cranks. Now that's not to say there's a whole bunch of bad cranks out there at all. I've also used um, Crower cranks very successfully. They make a very good crank, not exactly the cheapest in the world, but it's a very good crankshaft that they make. Also, I've used cranks from several other companies, which I can't think of at the moment, but they'll scroll down the screen. Although a crank like this is hardly expensive, it is something that your average engine builder will have to uh, be very conscious about not ruining the crank after they spent their hard-earned money. Now what we're going to do here is clear, check the crank clearance in that block without spending a fortune on measuring equipment and here's how we're going to do it. Okay enough on the block now let's look at the method we are going to use which instead of using expensive tools we're going to use a better couple of dollars worth of parts, no, product that you can get from Napa, O'Reilly or any of those stores, right? Pep Boys is another one. Let me just have a look around and see where I've got mine. Plastic age, that's what we're looking for. Yes, here's my trusty box. Right, I'm not going to unpack that all. I've already got some out somewhere. Well, here it is. Basically, plastic gauge is a thin strip of round section, soft plastic, deformable plastic. And what you do is you put a piece of this on the journal, put the bearing housing on, torque it up, and then take it back off. Now, the plastic gauge will squeeze. Now if you can see it, there's gauge marks down the side of this paper here. And the wider it gets, obviously the tighter the clearance is. So you compare the width and that gives you the clearance. Now it comes in two sizes. 
right this here is uh, for a clearance of that's the green stuff for a clearance of one thousandths to three thousandths which is what we'll be using for our crankshaft right this here is from two thousandths to six thousandths which well in some cases that may better but I already have a good idea of the clearance on this so we'll be using the green one so this plastic gauge deal sounds pretty simple put it between the bearing and the journal squeeze it up by torquing down the cap undo it measure the width of it and there you go well in essence it is simple but I'm going to show how to make it even simpler so that instead of struggling doing some of the jobs like torquing up the bearings and that we can do it easier so let me show you how here's a bearing cap and the bearing housing in the block this is a freshly done block here these housings were all in line uh, home to make sure they were spot on now what we're going to do is we're going to locate a cap on here and I've already greased these up with this uh, uh, ARP lube it's very important that you do that already greased up the cap oh a point to, point to note here is make sure this is chamfered here and here and that this edge is broken here and here there we go now we're going to zip these bolts down I'm going to use this uh, drill here and I've got it set on just four foot pounds so that I don't over torque them if you've got it set on too many foot pounds when it reaches the end of the travel it really jerks you around so we don't need that right though now we've got that down what we're going to do now is we are going to just put about 20 foot pounds on there so that's our next step I need to show you something here that will save you a lot of time and struggle right first off after having placed the cap on I'm just going to torque them down to just 30 foot pounds which is way short of what they actually run at right that's 30 foot pounds there and now I'm going to show you that how much this closes up as it's torqued up it requires I'm going to check with my my book but it I think it requires 65 on the outer ones and 75 on the inner ones what I'm doing here is setting this bore gauge so that it reads zero on the housing we're checking there we go that's dead on zero the answer is no but just to be sure we'll go to 60 well it may have closed up about a tenth but that's all I can see now let's torque this up to full torque that's 65 on the outer bolts 75 on the inner ones well here we are at full torque it looks pretty much spot on to me so what have we learned from this little escapade measuring the mains and torquing them up and measuring them and torque I'll tell you 
What we've learned is, is that it's not really necessary to torque the main bearings or in fact the big end caps on the rods because we're going to do those as well to full torque. Whereas it may not be too much of a struggle on the block to keep taking them on and off once or twice, it does wear thin after you've done it about a dozen times. Why would you do it a dozen times? Well, we'll get to that later on. But the thing that really pays off is when you come to check the rod bearings, you have to do two rods at once on one journal. And torquing those up to the requisite torque and untorquing them whilst the crank is still sitting on the bench or even in the block gets to be a hassle. We don't need to torque them up that much, so this is a good move here. We've shown that if we've got 30 pounds, foot pounds of torque on these mains, the most they will close up is a tenth of a thou. From 40, they don't close up at all. Well, this brings us to the end of part one. In part two, you're going to see the moves that need to be made to do the job cheaply and moves that you should be doing whether you're employing expensive measuring gear or not. They're all little tips to help power and reliability. Before I go though, I want to make a request here. Please click that like and subscribe button. It helps no end. Also, also you will be notified when part two comes out, which shouldn't be too far down the road. Thank you.